starting the recording and advising everyone that we are recording this session. I do have two o'clock by, uh, by by my computer time. We've got 47 on the on the bridge at this point. And we will then please turn to the bishop and ask for opening prayer. Thank you very much, Alec, and, and welcome. Good afternoon on a beautiful Friday afternoon. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to enjoy these Friday afternoon calls, uh, opportunity to meet with everybody and as we continue through this time together. Yeah. So as we, uh, as we gather, let us uh, pause for a moment of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we have a beautiful day in front of us, and it has been a beautiful week made ever more beautiful by the presence of your son, Jesus Christ, and the great festivals that we have celebrated this week. Rogation Sunday, where we have given thanks for the bounty that, that you have provided for us, for the good seed that is placed in the land, and for the hands that till the soil and provide the food for our tables. We give thanks for the Feast of the Ascension, as your son ascended to the right hand of glory. And now we wait for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit that we recall in the great feast of Pentecost before us. I ask you by the power of that spirit to be present here with us today, with the leaders of our diocese. We give thanks for their presence and for their ministry and the mission that they undertake together. And we pray that you would strengthen us in the work that we are called to do as we travel through these challenging days. Beyond our diocese, we pray for the communities in which we live for our province, the country, and the world, for frontline workers in all disciplines, and especially we pray for researchers who are working to synthesize a cure or a vaccine for COVID-19. Be with us always, Heavenly Father, and be that light and lamp for our path and our feet. It is your great promise to us. And in that promise, we trust this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, uh, we're going to move through a very similar pattern to what we've done in the last number of weeks. Um, I'm going to open up with just a few uh, brief remarks, and uh, Archdeacon Barley uh, will also be there. Alec uh, will have uh, an update for you uh, as well. And uh, we also have uh, today, as you notice on the agenda that is there, uh, Community of Foundations of Kingston has uh, partnered, and I think we have someone I don't know if it's Archdeacon Clark or, or Archdeacon Robertson is going to speak um, from our foundation about that partnership and uh, opportunities that might exist in similar partnerships uh, across the diocese. But just uh, by way of a brief update for me, we did have the call that I mentioned last Friday with the bishops of the province and the executive officers. Um, we met and had a, had a good, engaging uh, conversation out of which the executive officers uh, like to point out that when the bishops ask them to meet with them, it's usually because we have work for them to do. And this was no exception to that. So the executive officers have formed a small committee, and our own Alec Pearson is part of that. They're going to begin to uh, look at the, the various possibilities around uh, reopening in the future, how we will move out of uh, where we are currently at in terms of the pandemic, how we will connect with, uh, with the um, uh, experts and officials, uh, the provincial uh, medical officers of health, our, our uh, provincial government officials around the recommendations that we're receiving about reopening. So they're, they're gonna put that, begin to put all of that together. Um, they, they had their first meeting, I understand, uh, yesterday. It was a lengthy meeting, about two and a half hours as you can imagine, there are lots of nuts and bolts and nuances around how how this will go. And so we want to make sure as we move forward, my watchword through all of this is that I want to err on the side of extreme caution. Because this, this uh, particular virus has a high infection rate. And, and we are in a strange situation within our diocese. We have Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, which has had very few cases. We've just had one uh, pop up in the last couple of days. I think a grand total of 62, all of which, with the exception of that one that have been resolved. Leeds and Grenville is a different story. There's much more of a challenge, and it's the second highest rate of infection in the province. And then when you get down to Hastings and Prince Edward, that is somewhere in the mid-range within the province. No rhyme, no reason. I mean, there's lots of conjecture that has been, been offered as to why that's the case. But that covers the territory that we have responsibility for 
And uh, my mantra has been to err on the side of extreme caution because uh, this is this is a life and death uh, thing around these decisions. And, and I it's it's a serious thing to to uh, as we move forward. But we need to consider how to move forward and, and do that judiciously and well. So that meeting happened with the executive officers and the bishops. The executive officers have taken it in hand. Uh, we've also had uh, a, a couple of individuals from our area, uh, maybe possibly uh, uh, have made themselves available to provide advice um, until we have that confirmed. I, I won't let you know the names until we have it confirmed. But once we have that set up, um, there is good, solid expertise that will be providing advice to our executive officers so that we can engage with other authorities with some degree of knowledge and preparation. So that's going to, that's going to take place. Um, locally, we we did have Synod Council scheduled for uh, next uh, this coming Tuesday, but we didn't have a lot on the plate uh, that requires a decision at this point. And so June is going to be a much more involved time for uh, the Synod Council. We will have decisions to take around. We'll have much more uh, knowledge and awareness around what's happening in the province as this phased reopening begins. We'll be further down the road in terms of what's happening uh, with the with the infection rates and where that's going. I, I'm concerned by some of the articles I'm reading of, of experts who are warning of a second wave coming into the fall, what that will mean. So there's issues that might be a little clearer uh, for Senate Council date at the end of June. One of the big issues that we will be dealing with at that time is the Senate coming up. As you know, uh, we have put this eight week window in front of our weeks uh, and we just sort of plow everything out. And as we get down to the end of June, that eight week window will then take us into September. And uh, as you know, our Senate is, is set to go the end of October and, uh, and pre-synod meetings need to happen. There's a lot that, that has to get ready to put that in place. And so we're in the process of having a conversation. Uh, we'll be bringing the chancellor into it. And that's also a topic that has come up on the calls with the provincial bishops, because I think there are three of us, if I'm not mistaken, who have uh, synods around the same time and trying to consider what legally we have to do to make sure that we abide by our constitution, do the things we need to do. So that will be a discussion for Senate Council come the end of June. So they'll be convening then to work on, on those sorts of things. Uh, other than that, that's pretty well everything I had in my update, unless my colleagues have something that I have forgotten to, to, to bring forward. But with that, I'll turn it over and we'll follow the same pattern. Um, I'll speak Wayne and then Alec, and then we'll hear from our foundation. And then we'll move to a question and answer session. So again, uh, thank you very much for uh, for everything that you're doing. I can't say it enough. Um, the leadership in this diocese has been absolutely phenomenal within our parishes. The things that you're doing, the lay leadership, the clerical leadership, the services that were happening on Sunday. I had the joy of traveling around to uh, nine different services, and uh, I think uh, six, seven, seven of those were in the diocese and two were outside. And um, to be able to bring greetings and kind of encourage folks and, and uh, it, what you're doing is absolutely wonderful. So thank you so much for that. And uh, oh, just one more reminder uh, on Pentecost Sunday, we are and Mark Hauser has been working on this uh, together with uh, liturgical officers from across our ecclesiastical province. And each diocese has submitted a section of a Pentecost service that uh, will be going up on YouTube on uh, on Pentecost Sunday the 31st, and that will take place at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's when that will go live. It won't be a live service. It will be recorded and put together, but um, the various parts are coming in, and it's kind of exciting uh, to see how what's going to happen with that. So I know there's going to be all kinds of services on Pentecost, various parishes are doing, but 2 o'clock there will be a service that will be a province-wide service, and that will be available uh, from two o'clock there on. You can watch it at three in the morning if you want the next morning. So uh, that's going to be kind of kind of exciting. And um, oh, there one other uh, little things popping into my head. Please hold in your prayers, uh, Dean Shane Parker, uh, who was elected to serve as the next Bishop of Ottawa, succeeding uh, Bishop John Chapman, and uh, the consecration service. 
is going to be going ahead uh, in Ottawa at the Cathedral on Pentecost Sunday, the 31st. That will happen uh, later in the afternoon. And uh, I will be participating in that. We're going to have the bare minimum allowed at any one time in the cathedral. So in order to make a bishop, it's kind of like a wedding. You have to have uh, five in total. So um, anyway, there'll be three bishops consecrating, including our, our Archbishop Anne Germain and then Dean Parker and somebody videoing it. It will be live streamed. So if you want to watch that, um, that will be on the Diocese of Ottawa YouTube, and I don't know if we'll be making some links available for it, but I'm sure we can do that if you want to watch uh, a Bishop-elect Parker's uh, consecration. So that's the 31st of May. Uh, and that, that's everything that I have, and I'll flip it over to Archdeacon Varley for his update. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good being with you once okay. again. I just wanted to offer a brief update in respect of cemeteries. Last week, we discussed about uh, the guideline that they remain closed, the 50 or so we have in our diocese. We've received a few questions since then about what cemeteries with gates, if they should remain open or be closed, as well as signage. And so the guideline and recommendation to our cemetery committees is if your cemetery has a gate, please close it. And here is some suggested wording, brief and tight, in respect of uh, a signage that you may wish uh, to, to use. And so that, that's just a brief update in response to questions raised in the last few days. Cemeteries should remain closed, except for the purpose of graveside services, interments, and essential safety. The guidelines, the diocesan guidelines, flesh out a little bit more what we mean by some of these things, for example, safety. Thank you very much. And now, Alec, over to you. Thanks, I'm ready. I am ready. I was just I I was just hitting the button. Okay, takes that extra second though. It's right. Your device disconnected. So. Um, this chart's quite familiar to everyone by now, but you know, as you know, the, the, the money was received and has been distributed for, for period one and uh, period two and period three. Some of the, uh, just, just reminding folks that uh, we, we will, we have automatically qualified for period two, according to the, the federal government's guidelines. Um, and, and therefore we will be putting our application in this week and we'll, we'll similarly, it will be based upon the actual payroll data. So, and obviously for people on stipend or salary, that's consistent. But for those that are in, with variables in terms of uh, what, what the hours they have put in, or in some cases services, et cetera, that there may be some differences. But for the most part, um, the, the second period will look a great deal like the first period. Um, and our target is to have that into the May payroll invoices. We then need to reapply for period three, uh, which is May. And again, if, if we qualify for May, that means we'll also qualify for June. The government has announced that the program is extended out till August. Um, and, and they're going to continue to, when you qualify in one period, you automatically qualify in the next period. Um, and that doesn't say if you automatically don't qualify, you don't automatically are disqualified. But our intention is to collect the data from you for April and May's income in the churches in the same format that we did before. But, and obviously we can't collect May's data until May is done. So, um, Given the way that, uh, that that Sundays work, we will wait now until the first week of June, and then we will come back out to churches and request the uh, the same information that we got um, to support the, the month of March. And so the month of April will be there, so we have com completeness and, and in case we get checked. And the month of May will then determine whether we confirm or whether we will conf uh, be eligible for that period or not. Um, there has been some discussion from the federal government and we have done some lobbying where we can 
um, that they may change the criteria for some of the later periods, that 30% uh, may be too high. Uh, so there is lobbying underway um, and, and we are working our way through that. But at this time, for the month of May, uh, we will need to hit 30% over the previous May. And so that, that's the analysis that we will be doing once we collect that data, and that'll determine whether we can apply or not. So uh, uh, one other quick item, um, Ken and Michael Reed and uh, Mark Hauser, our communications officer, have, been, uh, have started to work on an online event. And that online event will be for clergy and anyone else who's interested or who looks after Sunday live streaming or recording or, or works on some of those pieces. I know in some of the churches, there's multiple people involved. And, and the idea here is to get together, to, to, to talk about you know, how you're doing streaming, how you're doing recording, what kinds of setups for, for equipment and software you're using, how well those things work, to share that with each other, and then um, for, to be able to provide some opportunities for improvement uh, or other ways of doing it, both from a software and a hardware perspective, including um, trying to be able to do some basic editing. So some cases where churches aren't doing it live, um, editing is a, is a very powerful thing because you don't have to get it all right in one take or you don't need to get it um, all right and you can edit those sections together. Um, and so Mark will be presenting some, some work on basic editing. That again will be we intended for a, people that aren't that familiar with how to use this stuff. So you'll be invited to send in questions ahead of time or topics that you you might like to have covered. Uh, so that because this again is a session for folks to share. Um, it'll also be the launch and the and the details on the online technology support fund um, as we we now start that rolling out. So we'll we'll build that in to that session as well. And that will be Tuesday, June the 2nd at 2 p.m. And there'll be more, more information coming out with an invitation. But again, this will be open to anyone who's interested, obviously clergy, anyone who's interested in the parish that's, that's working on it today, or anyone that wants to, uh, to, to pick up and, and do some, so, some more things. So a, a wide range of topics. And again, there'll be the opportunity to input ahead of time to be able to, uh, to, to help drive where this goes. So I'm going to, uh, to ask, I to flip over to, to Archdeacon Bill Clark, who um, I'm with working as, of course, the chair of our Diocesan Foundation, has been working with um, some of the community organization and the, uh, the Kingston Area uh, Community Foundation. So, Bill, do you want to take us away? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. We've got uh, three main points I want to cover with you today. Uh, one is a chance to say thank you to all of our donors, uh, to the Anglican Diocese of Ontario Foundation. Because of your generosity, uh, earlier in May, or it was perhaps it was late April, uh, we were able to make two grants of uh, $4,000 each, uh, one to Lunch by George and the other to Lion's Heart, which provides food also for people in Kingston and in Napanee. So again, thank you to everyone, all of our members and donors. Uh, two, as Alex and the Bishop mentioned, uh, we have entered into a partnership with the Community Foundation of Kingston and area. Uh, we now have a, a fund with them called Fearless Generosity. We're hoping that this fund will allow uh, or attract uh, donors who might not otherwise give to a religious organization, but it will also allow us to partner uh, with other agencies in their projects when those projects align with our goals and objectives. As, as an Anglican foundation, as a, as a diocesan foundation. So in that spirit, uh, with one person who has already made a donation of $1,000, uh, we match that 
donation and have made a, another $2,000 donation to Lunch by George and a $3,000 donation to the Sexual Assault uh, Crisis Center here in the city of Kingston as a part of their COVID-19 needs. Uh, the other big news to share with you is that you may be aware the federal government has created an emergency community support fund and they've released $350 million. That money has been dispersed, as you can see, uh, to the Canadian Red Cross, uh, Community Foundations of Canada, and to the United Way. The latter two have sent out that money to local community foundations and branches of the Red Cross, uh, or the, sorry, the United Way. So here in the Kingston area, the Community Foundation of Kingston received just over $400,000 and the United Way $900,000. They are now receiving applications uh, for grants uh, from registered charities as churches. We are registered charities uh, for projects responding to COVID-19 needs. So if you're a church that has a food program and you need to buy that new refrigerator or a bigger freezer, now's a good time to make the ask. You know, I think of places like uh, the Parish of St. Lawrence and St. Paul's in Brockville have feeding uh, food ministry programs. St. Thomas's Belleville has a community garden. Uh, St. George's Trenton is doing a lunch program. Uh, so these funds are going to be available for a little while. Uh, the United Way is taking applications up to June 9th, and the Community Foundation of Kingston will take applications until such time as that money runs out. The, the eligibility or the projects that can be supported are fairly wide ranging. And you'll see Alex has just put up the uh, website address for the application. If you're not sure if your particular parish is covered by these two organizations, either the United Way or the Community Foundation of Kingston, there is a website to go to. It's COVID or sorry, an email, you can you just send an email to see who, who covers you. COVID19 at communityfoundations.ca. And they'll link you up with the organization that can that's in their catchment area. So that's basically what I want to share with you today that some great work has has happened and can continue to happen. And that there are funds if you have a project that you need some assistance with uh, now's the time to ask questions alex great thanks bill so we'll we'll open up now for questions on anything we've covered or anything we haven't covered the the sins we've committed the sins we the things we have done and the things we have not done um, we'll open up as always. Uh, Laura Conway is online and will be um, doing, um, we'll be taking questions from the chat. So you can ask questions in the chat line and, uh, and Laura will then ask them. The Bishop, Wayne, Bill or I can, can respond. And, uh, or you can of course come off mute and, uh, and ask a question. We'd ask that if you're not speaking, if you stay on mute, just to keep the background noise down. So, questions. So, Laura, do we have anything on the chat line? Yes, there's one question. Um, we've been hearing discussion from our ecumenical partners about parking lot services. Is there any guidance or direction for our Anglican participation? I'd be happy, Alec, if Bishop, just to say a brief word about that. 
under the rubric of abundance of caution, we are not in favor of uh, drive-in worship. It is not viewed as a best practice. It is much more difficult to control. For example, um, the guideline from the province is a maximum of five people may be out of their vehicles and officiating. It may be difficult to keep people who happen by away. And also there is a technological piece to this. And at present, uh, we don't, there's not a sufficient supply but mainly for the purpose of abundance of caution, we are not at all in favor of drive-in worship. Thanks, Wayne. Any other questions? Alex, will the June 2nd event be recorded and posted on the website? A absolutely. Um, you know, again, this is a space of let's communicate, communicate, and then get it, communicate. So we will, an online event, our general practice will be to, to, to record them and post them online. And, uh, and again, you can ask questions. And even if you can't attend the event, you can ask a question and, uh, and then it'll be answered on the session. And you can listen to the answer by watching the recording later. So absolutely, it'll be recorded. And again, it's intended to, to be driven by those that are participating. Alex? Yes. Um, do we send those questions to Mark Hauser? Uh, we, will, we will give you the link to that, but I believe that's how we're gonna handle it. But we'll be send, okay. sending something out early next week. That'll be the official invitation and, and the details of how to do that. Okay. Thank you. Mark, unfortunately, is a little bit better, a little bit busy next week, because Mark, of course, the bishop mentioned the provincial uh, Pentecost service, and Mark is doing all the editing and and compilation. He does such an outstanding job that uh, we asked him to do that, and he's doing that for the province. So Mark will be a little busy, so we'll be we'll be working to to, to give him a hand. Alex, uh, Bill Nast here at St. Luke's, Camden East. Hi, Bill. Uh, I wonder if you can tell us um, when we can expect uh, that support from the federal uh, programs and how. Well, the the federal pro the the Canadian emergency wage subsidy was reflected on your um, on your April uh, payroll invoice, so that money was was the, was credit to your account in April. So that that money is already there. Okay. So uh, there there won't be any direct uh, payments to individual churches then or parishes. No, no. These, are, these are supporting. This that money is to support wages. That's what the government's um, driven for it. It's based around it. And and given that we we pay everything centrally out of the diocese, we've we've and we had to apply directly. We've credited that back to your payroll account. All right, thanks. Laura, do we have any anything else on the? Yep, yeah, there's one more or two more now. Um, the new Legacy Center um, for Christ Church Tamworth has a grocery program. Would the grant cover the purchase of grocery vouchers? Uh, the quick answer to that is yes, uh, because one of the things they're looking for is uh, support to vulnerable uh, elements of our community. So food programs are definitely being supported through these grants by your community foundation and the United Way. That's great. And we have a prayer request from Wayne Thornhill um, to add Betty Dunn to the prayer list. Um, her funeral is taking place during our call and she was 99, but lived with severe Alzheimer's disease for many years. We'll definitely do that in, in the closing prayers. What a, what a good long life.
Any other questions? Alex? Yes. In regard to the community support fund, sorry, Judy Elms from um, St. George's Trenton. Uh, will you have up on the website where to apply the information? So we will post um, uh, the information that Bill referred to in the web links. Uh, we'll, we'll post that for you on the COVID hub on our diocesan hub so that that's, that's available okay. there. And Bill, I'm presuming you're going to put those links on the diocesan foundation web page as well? Yes, we are. Good, thank you. Alex, will we receive a new form after May 31st that it, that shows April, May? Yes. For, for reporting revenues? Yep, you will. You'll receive that the first week of June. Okay, thank you. If I think it would be a little disingenuous to ask you to report your May income when it's not quite finished May yet. Maybe some of us are that taking a rant. Here. Here. <laughs> well, the Lord moves in mysterious ways, but it, it, it's hard. From, uh, yep, go it's hard calling from St. Uh, <clears throat> Andrews. Uh, will the subsidy be treated as income, or have you, has that been figured out yet? So we'll have to. We'll, we'll ultimately take that to council. My my expectation is that you know, given that it that it's supporting and driven by loss of income, my broad expectation is yes. Um, but that's based on the fact that, again, in, in 2021, um, incomes will be down. And so we, we need to, to look at the full scale of this before we make a recommendation back to Senate Council. But I, I would also say there'd be no expectation that anybody's would, would go up as a result. Any other questions? What you say? <laughs> yeah. You're a good boy. Um, yes, Alex, you're a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a while since anybody said that. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> uh, yeah. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share? Uh, any any sort of exciting news from one of your churches or something that's going well or Alex there's one more question on the chat okay has the application form for grants for audio equipment been sent and is it available it'll be that program will be will be um, rolled out at that June 2nd meeting so the the, the form and the and the detail, the criteria for it will be released at that June 2nd meeting. We decided to hold it until then so we can talk about that all in one package. Alex? Yes. Judy again from St. George's Trenton. Um, We've been very active. We have a phone tree going where um, people phone each other and the more vulnerable people we keep in contact with twice a week. Reverend Lynn does a 40 minute service each Sunday on uh, YouTube. And also she does a 10 minute children's service. Um, we have an online Bible study each week. And also every Sunday, um, we can go on Zoom, the three churches, we're a three point parish and uh, for two hours and it's just a chat about anything and just to see each other and find out how everybody's doing. And the other thing we have are brown bag lunches every week. And from those brown bag lunches, we usually deliver about 25 to uh, parishioners who are homebound and can't get out, especially when they're in apartments. They pretty well have to stay in their apartment. So yeah, we've been busy. That's great, great to hear. And I think 
you know, there's, there's, I think a lot of churches that, that picking up on a lot of those things, you know, I know most, most churches I talk to, there's some kind of a phone chain going on and people looking out for each other. And, um, you know, that, that I think is, is one of the things as a church community, you know, it's hard because we're not together on Sundays anymore. And very much that is our community, is it? And, and so now by doing the, the types of things, phone ch you know, chains, doing, you know, meetings like this online that people can, can just even don't have to have a reason, just like you say, just a social occasion. Those are all important things for us to remain community and, and to remain supporting each other. We don't know who's struggling and we don't always know why. So it's, it's wonderful for the, that, that help and support to be there. That's what churches are supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. Judy, I was I was looking forward to being part of your your drop in, and and I guess something happened. Zoom all over North America get into trouble on Sunday yeah. when my colleague says the church broke the internet because uh, everybody was doing church services and coffee hours and everything else like that. So anyway, looking forward to dropping in. But it reminded me when you mentioned that that uh, I've been asked now to, uh, and I've done this on a couple of occasions to bring greetings uh to parishes so uh, mark and i when we're recording my sunday service we record it uh earlier in the week um we also have a parish i've done uh, the the mohawk landing is happening uh in tyananaga and so on sunday i recorded a greeting for them and uh, i also recorded a greeting for christ church Cataraque, and that's kind of fun to do and say hello to everybody so uh there's different things we can do but i'm looking forward to uh to to doing a zoom drop in with you very good, and we're looking forward to it yeah. too. Great fun. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question for Judy. Yes. Oh, I'm Sylvia Dopking from downtown Odessa. Um, how do you get on the brown bag list, and who makes the brown bag lunches? I, oh, you're uh, a little far away from me, but I just was thinking if we were going to try it. Uh, we follow protocol and uh there's four of us in the hall and spread out each has have a job and we have one person in the kitchen and he makes all the sandwiches and then um we serve them at the front of the church we have a table outside and we're fortunate we have a ramp where they can come up and that's all marked with chalk and flowers decorated <laughs> and uh, then they go down another ramp where there's steps and um yeah so we have sandwiches we have uh fresh vegetables cut up like celery carrots we have um homemade cookies or squares or a muffin and a fruit for them and, and then this is just we have for a your congregation or do you reach out into the community? Oh no, it's for the community too. And then we deliver also to shut-ins. Yeah. How, how many, did you mention how many brown bags do you do on an average? Um, about 40. Yeah. We started out with 59, but it was too many. So we all had a good lunch too. <laughs> Very good. Um, just to, just to mention, Judy, that's, and that's excellent with the with the brown bag. They do the same thing. Uh, Bill had mentioned with the foundation presentation, Lion Hearts, and uh, some may remember yeah. Travis Blackmore, who uh, used to work in our diocesan book room, and he he's been part of a whole series of dif different uh, initiatives that that now has kind of morphed all together into into Lion Hearts and a lot of different things. Uh, and you, and you may remember. Uh, Certainly down in uh, in Trenton and and Frankfurt, Glenn Miller, Liam Thomas, I think Liam is working with them as well on uh, on some of those okay. projects. My understanding is, and Bill might you might have later figures than I have, but uh, they did in Amherstview uh, 700 dinners uh, that they put together in a, and I saw photographs of them being prepared and put together. It's it's rather remarkable assembly and they've been also doing the same thing in Kingston. I don't know, Bill, if you had up to date figures on that, but that's the number I, I had. No, they're doing slightly more numbers downtown Kingston and I think similar in, in Napanee. 
They were at the uh, Amherst, who uh, I think at the community or at the uh, Lions. If I remember the picture I saw was from the Lions Hall in in, in Amherst. Okay. And then they're involved in Napanee as well. I'm going to talk to get hold of somebody uh, who's involved with Lions Heart and talk to them. Thank you. Anybody else? Alex? Yep, go ahead. There's a comment on the chat um, from Liz Austin, who I believe is from Gananoque. Um, they have a refugee family that they had helped sponsor and they now own a small catering business. However, with the pandemic, they require um, a more professional kitchen. So they've asked um, the church if they would be able to like, use their kitchen. What would the rules be for that? So at, at this point, we are still, you know, we are we are still in the in the phase where renting out or using out the, the facilities is um, is not something that's inside the parameters that for uh, as, as a matter of safety. Uh, I can tell you that as we look at the the future steps, that would be part um, apart from corporate worship or being able to gather for worship. One of the other key things is both. Um, for for ministries that go on outside uh, or go, go on in the facilities um, or and, and and also rental groups groups that use our halls etc those are all things that would come in the next steps but at this time we we we, we can't sort of let outside groups in uh, to be able to use those types of facilities unfortunately Okay, any other questions or any other offerings of? I, I, if you notice on the opening chart that we showed, this is the ninth of these sessions. And I, and I started to say the ninth in a series of, but you know, um, much like, a, much like a, a good TV show, um, these will go on uh, as long as there is need, I think we're we still see each week anywhere from 60 to 80 of you join. Um, for us, it's important. We stay it helps us stay connected and and hearing things. Uh, we still have things to talk about each week. So our, our plan is that we'll continue with these uh, until people stop showing up. Um, so with that then, Bishop, we have no further questions and we will turn back to you for closing prayer. Thank, thank you very much, Alec. And again, thank you all for your uh, attendance and your diligence and your participation today and your questions. So just as we close, let us uh, pause for a moment of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you praise and thanksgiving yet again for this day and for the opportunity we've had to gather here in this place and for all that we have discussed the plans that we are making for the ministries that continue to happen across our diocese and for the faithful people we give thanks who carry them out as we come to the conclusion of our time together today we give you thanks for your faithful servant betty dunn we give thanks for her long life and we pray that you'll receive her into the light of your glorious presence Rest eternal, grant unto her, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon her. May her soul and the souls of all the departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. May we be blessed from this day forward. May your presence be with us. May we be strengthened and encouraged as we move forward into the future that is always in your loving hands. And in Jesus' holy name, we offer this prayer. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful uh, weekend and week coming up and, and look forward to being with you again uh, next Friday.